OpenAI have just released their first ever AI agent. And quite honestly, this is the most important product release in the AI industry since the beginning of ChatGPT in 2022. In this video, I'm gonna give you an overview of Operator, their AI agent. We're gonna go into some of the product features, how it works, and give you a bit of a demonstration. We're then gonna give you some of the limitations around the product capabilities today. For those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Alfie Marsh. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Toolflow AI. We're a startup that specializes in building AI agents. On our platform, you can actually build your own agents and automations without a single line of code. And if you'd rather have experts handle it, you can actually hire us with our agency and we'll build them for you. Not only do we have our platform, but we also offer educational workshops for your employees to help them upskill in everything AI. So if you're interested in transforming your business for the era of AI, then click on the link in the description below and book a call with our team. Now, with that being said, let's get into the video. So there are a couple of things that we should go into before jumping into the live features and going through the product itself. The first is that this product operator, the AI agent, is only available on their pro plan. Now their pro plan costs 200 bucks a month. There is the 20 buck a month plan, which is called the plus plan, but this isn't currently available. Now we do anticipate that the operator AI agent will be available on the plus plan uh, for those 20 buck a month subscriptions in the future. We just don't know what the timing is. So the real question, is it worth that 200 bucks a month right now? The other limitation is that this is only available in the US for the time being. Okay, so let's start with an overview. What is this AI agent? So OpenAI have called their agent Operator. Effectively, it takes control of its own internet browser and it can perform tasks for you. So it will interact with this internet browser like a human. It can scroll through the screen, it can click on buttons and it can fill out forms. And as OpenAI says in their product release, the ability to use the same interfaces and tools that humans interact with on a daily basis broadens the utility of AI. Now, it's very clear that some of the features that they've released with this uh, product, uh, they're going to expand this operator agent to more than just an internet browser. For the time being, it really is about this use of the internet and performing tasks on your behalf, like going shopping, booking tickets and flights and these sorts of things. Uh, but I'm going to go into some of the details as to why I think this has much, much broader consequences. Okay, so once you've actually paid for your pro subscription and you're in the US or you're using a VPN, uh, you can open up your ChatGPT. Now, if you do open up ChatGPT, um, you're not actually gonna see it straight away. If you click down on the, the drop down menu, you won't see this in your list of models. You actually have to open up the sidebar and then you need to go into uh, the operator mode here. Once you've actually opened up uh, Operator, it will look very similar to ChatGPT. The main difference is at the bottom of the chat interface, you actually have some of these kind of pre-made options. So very quickly, we can start seeing some of the use cases. You can do things like booking tickets for concerts and sport events, uh, ordering groceries online, filling out forms for insurance, going onto Amazon and actually purchasing things. So there's a bunch of kind of pre-made uh, prompts that you can type in here. But effectively, as soon as you start using one of these, it's going to open up the internet browser and it's going to start clicking and scrolling and performing these actions for you. Now, if you decide to not choose one of these pre-made templates and you start typing, you're going to notice something very interesting. As soon as you start typing on the screen, you can see that there's, there's a list of apps. Now, apps is short for applications. And I think this choice of words is very, very telling. Uh, this list is basically a bunch of websites that OpenAI have worked with these companies to kind of help train their model to be able to figure out how to use their website the most effectively uh, to be able to get the task completed. Now, obviously, this can work with um, websites that it hasn't been trained on, but they've done this kind of collaboration to make sure that the user has a better experience. Um, but it's that, you know, th these are websites, these are not applications. So the question is, why would you use the word apps? So if we take a look at some of the recent product releases from OpenAI, we know that they just released their desktop app. And this desktop app is basically the same thing as going to a Google Chrome, or any other browser typing in ChatGPT, except it's an application on your desktop. Now, the main reason for doing this is because it can now actually use their vision models to see what's happening on your computer screen, and it's going to be able to start taking action on your computer. So I think that they've called this apps because they're not just thinking about using the internet browser to perform tasks, but they're thinking about you asking requests to perform tasks across your entire computer and applications. So think about all of the tasks and work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, from opening up business intelligence tools, creating reports, editing things on Canva, creating things in Adobe Premiere Pro. 
These are all tasks that potentially operator could do for you. Another really interesting feature which was recently launched in ChatGPT is called Tasks. Now this also has a really important uh, correlation to this agent because if you start running one of these operations, you will see in the top right hand corner of ChatGPT that you can save a task. So if you were to go on and click on save task, you're going to be able to see that you can basically create uh, an operation effectively, um, something that you do every day. So this task might be something as simple as search for a particular news item every Every day, analyze it, and then send me an email which is going to summarize this information. So that might be what the task is. But the fact that we can create a task and then schedule it to be done is really actually quite massive. Although the applications of this in this very first release are quite limited, when you think about expanding this operator agent to all of your applications on your desktop as well as the internet browser, you're going to be able to start teaching this agent all of the types of work that you're doing. It's gonna be able to learn how you use applications and you're gonna be able to record these tasks that you do again and again and again, so it can just do it for you. This is a huge, huge change to the way that we're gonna be doing work. And I really do think that work in the future is gonna be much less about doing the grunt work of work. And we're gonna be more focused on the creative and strategic side of dictating what types of tasks these agents do on our behalf. Another really exciting feature is the ability to give very specific instructions on how you want the operator agent to interact with certain websites, uh, ultimately giving your preferences. So if you open up, for example, the booking.com website here as an app, you can kind of let them know what your preferences are or any other instructions on how to use this app. So for example, I might say something like, I only want to take red eye flights. So then when I give the operation to uh, this operator agent to go and book me flights to, let's say, New York, it's going to go onto booking.com and it's only going to look for red eye flights only. Now this is really really helpful for giving preferences yes but I think there's going to be another reason why uh, operator does this. Now one of the limitations of this agent is the fact that it can go onto the website of this particular place. So let's say it's going to go to open table and book you a restaurant and when you actually get to the point of booking you're going to need to log in. Now because OpenAI have basically created their own internet browser this browser doesn't have any of your passwords or your email saved. It also doesn't have any any of your credit card details saved. And um, they've also put in some restrictions to prevent you from actually taking financial transactions or making financial transactions uh, on these websites um, automatically. So you can still do them, you just need to manually sort of step in. Now, if you open up the uh, browser here, you can see that when you hover over, there is always a take control screen. So you can stop and basically take control of the application and you can do that midway through an autonomous run, but it's also gonna stop at various intervals. For example, it might stop before you need to to log in. Now the reason why those custom instructions is really interesting is because I think people in the short term are going to use them to save things like passwords and emails or other credentials or authentications. Now I imagine that privacy and all of these sorts of things are going to be built into the product over time so they will probably have password management kind of uh, implemented inside of this but this is really the first release so we can't expect too much just yet. Okay, so let's look at some limitations. There are some websites that they might actually block or not give you di direct access to. Um, in this case, I'm gonna try and scrape some information from LinkedIn. Um, now, I might want to either log in and actually create list, for example, a list of all VPs of sales in North America and then send them a DM. So I might wanna go to LinkedIn and log in onto that profile and then see if it will actually send messages. Now, it's highly likely that this is one of those blocked scenarios and those blocked things that they're going to try and kind of err on the side of caution because this does break T's and C's of LinkedIn. Um, but I have managed to get it to go and search for my own profile via Microsoft Bing. Now LinkedIn has a bunch of public profiles so you don't have to log in to see all this information. If for some of the more advanced information you would have to log in. So in this case, I then asked the uh, operator agent, and I did this with me as a human in the loop, can you scrape the information or extract the key information that's publicly available? And as you can see here, it's done exactly that. So this could be very useful for those sorts of tasks, but you do have to be careful. There are certain types of tasks and websites which they will block. The other limitation for me is that it's just quite slow. So realistically, it would be a lot quicker for me to order my groceries manually or a lot quicker for me to book a flight. It does seem to click on things that it wasn't quite meant to. It has to go up and down the page quite a lot. Uh, it's clearly been trained to work better on the websites that it has in the recommended list, but I'm not too sure how well this is going to be able to navigate other websites it hasn't really been trained on. Now, the real question is, 
is the extra time it takes for an individual action to uh, be completed, is that outweighed or offset by the fact that you can do this autonomously and I can open up multiple tabs and have the agent perform lots of parallel tasks? I think the answer to that is probably yes for like very specific tasks. For the ones that are given on the demo, I definitely don't think it's worth 200 bucks a month, but I think this is clearly an experiment for OpenAI to basically test how does the agent work, figure out all the bugs, and then once they've got the internet browser working well, they're going to push this out to other applications as well. And that's going to be very, very interesting when this agent can control apps, it can go on the internet, it doesn't make mistakes, and there aren't as many restrictions as to what it can do. Ultimately, we are going to be able to clone ourselves, our actions, our tasks, our tone of voice. We're going to be able to have these agents effectively taking over uh, and duplicating our own skills and capabilities, which is both equally scary uh, and exciting for what that means for our future. And finally, what does this mean for the future? As we said, right now, it only works for the internet browser, but I think that they're going to quickly follow up with apps. They're probably going to need to work with all these different individual applications to figure out the best ways for the agent to communicate with them. It needs to understand what do the buttons do? What's the correct process to go from A to B? In fact, it would actually make more sense if there was a kind of a general protocol which allowed these apps to communicate with the agent to say, this is how you should click and use us in order to get your action or task completed. And this is actually something that Anthropic has been releasing with the MCP protocol. It's basically trying to create a standardized way for agents to interact with these applications. This does beg the question, why would we not already do this with APIs? Because APIs already exist, they're far quicker, I think the only downside of that is there's this long tail of use cases where there aren't APIs for things. Think about your bank or your insurance company, all these kind of old school websites that you have to go and interact with that aren't technology first, they don't have these APIs. These agents could go and then learn how to use these websites. So we're really gonna have to see how well can this agent figure out how to use applications and websites without any specific training on that app. Um, and if it can, then great. And if it does need that training, I really wonder, is the API gonna be better? The next logical step for this agent is to be able to store your login details like your emails and your passwords. Not only that, but to store your credit card payments so it can log into sites, it can perform things on your behalf as if it were you, and then also pay and make transactions in the real world. So right now to do all these things, you do have to have a human in the loop, which naturally makes me think, well, why would I wanna be in the loop on a task which is actually longer to do here than if I was to do it myself? So there is kind of this, cognitive dissonance right now that I wonder where is this going to go and what kind of use cases this is really going to tackle but I think that once there is full autonomy and it can log into all of your applications and websites as well as having your own credit card details then it's going to be able to do some extremely powerful things it will rely on humans to actually train the tasks and say this is how i work or this is how i operate but we are going to be able to scale up the amount of work we're able to do very 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 quickly leaving us to focus on the things that we love to do instead of the grunt work. And lastly, I think the most important takeaway from this is we have learned as a business to market and sell and negotiate and interact with human beings. Human psychology has been a huge part of understanding how to be able to sell better and market better and communicate and position products. But when we are going to have an ecosystem of AI agents that are acted on behalf of humans, this adds another layer. We're going to have to market to agents. We're going to have to transform the way we do business so that we can negotiate with an agent. We're going to have to think about how an AI agent takes information and breaks it down and passes that on to humans for other decision making. This is a completely new world that we're heading into and if we just think it's all about human relationships there is going to be multiple layers of agents working with agents on our behalf and it really does beg the question what are humans going to do and what are agents going to do whatever the answer to that question is i don't know but it's very clear to me that we're on the verge of unlocking an absolutely enormous wave of productivity that the world has just simply never seen before. It's like you've just discovered a new land with billions of people who are hyper intelligent and can take action for you and you've kind of accessed this workforce. We are entering a very scary and equally very exciting period of time. It's not exactly clear where humans are going to fit into this versus agents. But I think what is clear is human capacity is a about to absolutely explode and the things we're going to be able to do with our time are going to increase exponentially.
So putting this all together, what does it mean for the future and where is this stuff going? So very clearly, this is going to interact with other applications on our desktop and our computers, not just the internet. We're going to be able to start providing our authentications and logins as well as payment methods. So the capabilities of these agents is only going to increase. I think one of the most interesting things that's going to come of this is there's going to be an entire ecosystem and population of agents working on behalf of humans who are then going to interact inevitably with other agents. Very soon we're going to have agents marketing to agents. You know, for history, we've had to figure out how to market to humans and understand human psychology. But what about agents? What's the best way to negotiate with an agent? What's the best way to sell a product to an agent or market and explain all of the benefits of your product? These are things that businesses are going to have to figure out very, very soon. So if you like this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button. And with that, see you next time.